Hello, and welcome to Sexuality and Developmental Disabilities 101. My name is Yetta Myrick, and I'm the Health Information Specialist with the Parents Place of Maryland. I will be the moderator for today's presentation. For those of you who may not be as familiar with Parents Place, I want to take a minute to share a little bit about us. PPMD's mission is to empower families as advocates and partners in improving education and health outcomes for their children with disabilities and special health care needs. We are Maryland's Parent Training and Information Center, Family to Family Health Information Center, as well as the state affiliate of Family Voices. We are mostly funded through federal and state grants and have been in operation for over 25 years. We are a family founded and run organization and we assist families to navigate the education and healthcare systems. We do this by providing one-on-one -on -one assistance to families, resources and information providing them to families and providers, workshops and trainings for families and providers statewide, parent leadership development, and we work and advocate to promote systems change to improve services for families of children and youth with special health care needs and disabilities. It is PPMD's role to help parents to better understand their child's disabilities, education, and health care needs, communicate more effectively with schools, doctors, related professionals, and agencies, understand their rights and responsibilities under special education law and regulations and their rights and responsibilities in healthcare systems, obtain appropriate services, resolve disagreements, and connect with other community resources. Today's guest speaker today is Marcia Stepinski. Marcia has worked in special education for over 10 years in various roles, ranging from special education teacher to program directed, director, excuse me, to board certified behavior analyst and now as a sexuality educator. Marcia specializes in working with adolescents and young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Her special interest is in sexuality and sexuality education for young people with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities. She has worked internationally educating and training parents and professionals on strategies and best practices for teaching sexuality education to young people with IDD. In addition to being passionate about sex education, Marsha loves going, to travel, going on travel adventures, food adventures, and spending time with her wonderful fiance and her kitten. So welcome, Marsha. I'm so very happy and so is PPMD to have you here um, to present to our families. Thank you so much, Yetta, and thank you, PPMD, for inviting me. I'm very excited and happy to be here talking with you all about sex education and why it is especially important for our young people with developmental disabilities. So why does it matter? Well, first, there are many schools in the country that do not offer sexuality education at all. Actually, about 50% of schools do not teach sex education. Um, they may teach abstinence-only education um, in place of offering a comprehensive sex education curriculum. Um, most of our young people with disabilities are often included from this information and in education, or they might receive a very shortened sex education curriculum or maybe a single class, um, but they're not getting the same access and exposure that typically developing students are receiving in school. Um, a lot of people have this misconception that if you talk about this subject and teach this information, it means that young people are going to go out there and become sexually active. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but what we know is that that's false. And we have research that actually shows us that young people who receive comprehensive sex education actually wait longer to become sexually active and are more likely to follow safer sex practices. Whereas young people who do not receive sex education or receive abstinence only sex education are less likely to follow safer sex practices. It also normalizes the topic. You know, the more we talk about something, the less taboo and uncomfortable it becomes. When we talk about sex and sex education and talk about it in a positive way, it combats a lot of the negative and unhealthy messages that we hear about sexuality in our culture. Um, as parents, it shows your children that they can trust you. You want to be the person that your child goes to when he or she has a question. You want to be the provider of information. Um, if your child is not using you as a source 
for information, they might be going to other places. That could be the internet, which we know the internet can be a very wonderful place, but it can also be sometimes a scary place, especially as it relates to sex. Um, or they might be listening to what they hear their peers talking about in class. So we want them to be going to you and getting information from you. It's an opportunity for you to express your values to your kids. Uh, and when we talk about sexuality and sex education, it increases sexual health and reduces the likelihood of sexual abuse. Next slide, please. So what does sexual health mean? Well, it means that we feel good about ourselves and we understand our bodies. It means we have high self-esteem. It means we feel good about our gender identity and our sexual orientation. It means that we have relationships that are positive and pleasurable and not exploitive. And that's not just romantic relationships, that's also friendships. We wanna make sure that our young people, when they go to a job site, they know the difference between a friend and someone that's taking advantage of them by asking them for $5 every day because you know I forgot my lunch. Um, we want them to know the difference between someone that's taking care of them and cares for them versus someone who's taking advantage of them. And we want them to be able to make healthy decisions about their own about their body. Um, we want them to have information so they can make those healthy decisions. And of course, should they want to be sexual, we want them to avoid STIs, unintended pregnancies, and other challenges that may arise. Next slide. So what are our goals for this webinar? Well, first, we're going to discuss some common misunderstandings about sexuality and sex education. We'll talk about sexuality as it relates to people with developmental disabilities, and we'll go over some tips, tools, and resources to help you and your child. Next slide. So, true or false, sex education is just talking about sex. False, this is not true. The reality is the topic of sex makes up a very small percentage of a comprehensive sex and health, health curriculum. When we refer to sexuality education, we are talking about teaching young people about their bodies, good hygiene, self-esteem, self-image, friendships, healthy relationships, decision-making, communication, what abuse looks like, what does consent mean? The list is endless. Yes, sexual activity and contra contraception and STIs are also included on that list, but they make up 1% of the total. Unfortunately, more often than not, when you say sex education, people usually stop hearing you after you say the word sex and they kind of miss that education piece. But the truth is, is that sex education is so much more than just sex. By not educating our young people, um, we're leaving them without critical information related to their physical, emotional, social, and sexual health. Next slide. True or false? Talking about sex basically gives my child permission to become sexually active. False, this is another one that's not true. And we kind of touched on this earlier. We have research that tells us that young people who receive sex education are not actually going out there and be, being sexually active. Um, but a lot of parents worry that in discussing sex and sexual activity, they're encouraging their child to become sexually active. And this is a myth. Um, by discussing having these discussions and open communication with your child, you are showing them that you are someone they can trust and you are someone they can ask questions to. You are their primary source of information and you want to have those open channels with, those, with your children. You want, to, you want them coming to you to find out the what, where, when, how, and why. Uh, I like to tell parents that about 60% of sex education should happen in the home. It's okay to have parents, uh, excuse me, it's okay to have teachers or therapists or other trusted providers help to teach your child information, but ideally the bulk of it is coming from the parents. Next slide. True or false, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities do not need sex education. False, this is the most false. And this one actually gives me pain when I hear statements like that. And me there are- Me too, Marsha, me too. <laughs> it's, yeah, it like, I feel it just now, even putting the slide together, I feel it. Uh, there are so many reasons why people think we can exclude those with IDD from sex education. And some things that we hear a lot are, oh, they're like a child. Oh, she'll never be in a relationship, so we don't need to talk about it. Or, you know, people with disabilities are over sex, so if we talk about it, it's just gonna make it worse. 
Um, people with disabilities can't be trusted to make decisions. There's no point to, point to talk about it. Um, you know, this is just a phase. They'll, this is going to pass, so we should, we're better off just ignoring it. And these are all terrible, terrible things to say. Um, we need to change our thinking when it comes to young people with disabilities. Although a young person may have delays across all domains of development, puberty comes right on time. Young people with IDD express the same urges, desires, and needs. Whether they are able to tell us with words or show us with their behaviors, we know that most people are sexual beings. Um, I should add that there are many people with and without disabilities who identify as asexual, and that's okay too. Um, but by continuing to think of our young people as childlike, in need of protection, and incapable of making decisions, we are actually denying them and their sexuality and leaving them without really important information related to their physical, social, sexual, and emotional health. Um, for this population, access to sexuality education is not just about the right to having this information. Unfortunately for this population, access to this information plays a very key role in protecting these young men and women from abuse. Um, we don't know the exact rates of abuse because only about 3% of abuses involving young people with IDD are reported, but approximately 80% of women and 30% of men with IDD are sexually assaulted or abused at some point in their lives. It's a pretty horrific statistic and one that's not discussed enough, um, but there is a way we can combat abuse and protect our young people and help empower them to be safe, and that's through education. So we should really look at education as prevention. Next slide. So we kind of dispelled some myths. Now let's kind of talk about sexuality and, and some of the messages that we hear in our society about sexuality. And some of the things that we see and hear are that sex is typically for younger people, 25 to 35 year olds. Generally, we think of sexual people as attractive, in good shape. Um, you know, we think of blonde hair, blue eyes, tall, physically fit. Um, that's a lot of times what people think of attractive or as sexual. Um, we hear things like good girls don't do it. You should wait until you're married. Um, we certainly don't think of elderly, elderly people as being sexual, but they are. And definitely people with disabilities. We don't ever consider them as being sexual be beings. Um, people with disabilities hear those same type of messages that they're not sexual, that they should not have sex. Um, that they're like children. So one of the reasons that it's hard talking about sex is because we've listened to all these negative messages throughout our life. And that can, when we're now grown ups and we have to now talk about sexuality with our young people, a lot of times those negative messages that have been in our head are kind of still sitting in there. Or maybe no one spoke with you about sexuality and that kind of sends its own message. Not having anyone talk with you about it may make it seem like it's something taboo or shameful. So if we're feeling like this is negative or taboo or shameful, it's going to be really hard for us to then have conversations with other people about it. So we need to kind of shift our mindset away from thinking about sexual development and sexuality as a negative thing. You know, it's not to say that this is not something that's scary. Certainly it's scary thinking about your child maturing through puberty and experiencing intimate or sexual desires, but it's normal. Next slide. So what is your role as a parent or a caregiver? Well, the first is that you're the provider of information. And we already talked about why that's so important. Um, you want to share information. You want to share your values and your beliefs surrounding relationships, dating, marriage, sex. Um, you want to listen. If your child is able to speak with you, then you want to listen to their questions. You want to listen to their thoughts. Um, you want to be a model for them. And we are always modeling behavior for our children. And it's such an excellent teaching tool. And it can be really effective when we're trying to teach some more complex concepts. Um, for example, like consent. Teaching consent is a really, really tough thing, um, especially if you have a child that's already impacted cognitively. Um, it may feel silly for you to ask your child for permission before giving them a hug or giving them a kiss but it's a really powerful way to teach your child that he or she is in charge of his or her own body. So we can come up with a lot of really creative ways for how we can model socially appropriate uh, behaviors for our young people and also safe behaviors for our young people. 
We want to support them. You want to answer questions honestly, keyword honestly. Um, so if you don't know something, it's okay to say, I don't know. And we want to try to respond in a positive way or at least a neutral way. Um, again, we don't want to make our young people feel shameful about what they're thinking or experiencing. Um, we don't, we want to stop the trend of negative messages and, and messages about sexuality that are shameful. Next slide. So human sexual development, a super speedy overview. So we typically think of sexual development as puberty um, and just puberty alone, but sexual development is a process that actually occurs across uh, throughout the lifespan. Um, it really starts with the development of our biological sex and that happens before we're even born. It just happens in utero and it's based on a combination of X's and Y's as we all know. So a person with a double X chromosome is typically born with female parts. Uh, and when we're talking about biological sex, we're referring to the parts. So female parts include a vulva and vagina. A person with an XY chromosome is typically born with male parts penis and testes. So that's the first thing that happens is the development of our biological sex. Once we're born, we then are assigned our gender, right? So that's when we look at the parts and say, this is a boy, this is a girl. So biological sex refers to parts, gender refers to the rules or the norms that we've created for men, for females or for males. Um, we teach children how to act like a boy or a girl. Some common examples of gender norms are girls like pink and boys like blue, boys like trucks and girls like dolls. Um, we know that, of course, that is not the case. Girls can like whatever they want and boys can like whatever we want. Um, we think that at around three or four years of age, children begin to develop their own sense of gender identity. Um, this means that they begin experiencing their own feelings of being male, female, or neither, because we do now know that gender does not always fit into the binary of boy, girl, man, woman. Um, as we move into adolescence, this is when we start experiencing a lot of those physical changes of puberty, hair, smells, pimples, all of that good stuff. And we also start learning about the dynamics of friendship and relationships. We start expressing ourselves sexually, exploring masturbation, sexual orientation, dealing with our first heartbreak. Um, but then as we move into adulthood, we find that many of these topics are the same, the same issues and concerns. Um, they don't just stop when you're a teenager. But we also have some more things that we have to deal with as an adult. And this is dealing with marriage, pregnancy, parenting, managing your own health, body image, menopause, and then changes in our sexual functioning. So that was a very fast overview of human sexual development. Next slide. But it was thorough, it was thorough Marsha. It oh, was thorough. thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> we, could spend, we could spend all day talking about it. I know. <laughs> Next. So I would like everyone to just kind of... in in that quick overview, just pause for a second to think about, you know, if we have two children, one with a disability, a developmental disability, and one who's typically developing, what about their, their development is going to be the same? And what about their development is going to be different? Because there are things that are the same, uh, but there are things that are very different. And we have, to, we have to identify both of those if we're going to offer our young people uh, the best education possible. So you can think about that, but I'm going to go to the next slide and tell you. So what's the same? Well, everyone is assigned gender at birth, right? It doesn't matter whether you're born with a disability or not. Um, chances are there's a doctor who's looking between your legs to see what's there and making the announcement of it's a boy or it's a girl. Um, those gender roles are reinforced. Um, the biological changes happen. Like I said, no matter how impacted your child is, uh, they can be, their development can be impacted across all areas, cognitive, fine motor, gross motor language, but puberty is always going to happen right on time. The need for information is based on biological age, and this is a really important piece. Um, we have to shift away from this mindset of she's 16 years old, but really she's more like a three-year-old. Um, the fact is, is that a person who is 16 needs information that's relevant to a 16 year old. What's going to be different is how we teach that information. So chances are you're going to have to break the subject matter down into very, very small parts and present each part one time, one at a time. Um, you're probably going to have to repeat the lesson, repeat the activity three, four, sometimes 10 times before you can move on to the next step. You might have to remove all the text and add lots of pictures or make the text really big. 
Um, but all of these modifications and accommodations can be made so that information can be delivered based on biological age. Um, because really, if we just keep thinking about that 16 year old as a three year old, we're really doing that person a disservice. Um, young people, whether or not they have a disability or not, uh, have sexual feelings and needs, and they also have dreams just like anyone else. They may want a relationship, they may want marriage, they may want babies. Whether or not that's something that's realistic for them, that's, you know, that's a different webinar, but they still have those dreams and desires like everyone else. Next slide. So what's different? Well, first is they lack access to information about sexuality, right? We had already talked about that 50% of the states don't offer sexuality education. And in the places that do, a lot of times young people are not getting any information or they're getting a very small piece of information. Um, there's this assumption that they don't have sexual feelings and needs and so they don't need this information. Um, we, Often, like I said, consider people with disabilities, even though they're 16 or 17, we still sometimes think of them like a child, right? They're really, they're really more like a five-year-old or a six-year-old. And sometimes it means that we will forgive behaviors that we would never excuse for someone else. Um, so if you were sitting on the metro and a stranger kept winking at you, that would probably make you really uncomfortable. Um, but I know of a young woman who would wink at strangers on the metro and everyone just said, oh no, it's fine, don't worry about it. I, you know, I, I know it's, she's, I know it's okay, it's okay. And the reality is, is that it's not okay. It makes people uncomfortable, but it also may be an invitation for a predator to approach you because they can tell, oh, you're winking at me. You look different, you seem different. I'm, this might be something I could take advantage of. Um, so we're really doing a disservice when we think of our young adults as being children and we excuse behaviors that we would never excuse for a typically developing adult. Um, a lot of times our young people with disabilities lack access to friends and social opportunities. So much of what we learn about sex and relationships, um, we learn not in school and not in a book. We learn it from our friends. We learn it from sleepovers. We learn it from hanging out after school. And a lot of our young people don't have have those opportunities and so they miss out on all of those natural learning opportunities. Next slide. They often lack privacy to explore their sexuality and this is one that I like to highlight because I think you know in any sex ed program you talk about public behaviors and private behaviors and public places and private places um, but a lot of people forget that you then have to give that person privacy we can't talk about doing private things in private places and then never give you a private place to do that thing um, so we need to make sure that when we're having these conversations that we're also thinking about opportunities to give those young people access to privacy um, a lot of parents let go of their, their dreams for their child related to sexuality or dating. Um, they think of them as not sexual or understandably so worry about potential for abuse. Um, like we said, I right, already talked about how you teach the information is going to be different, um, but the information should really be based upon that child's age. Um, and young people with disabilities have a wide range of abilities and limitations, and so that's going to impact how they learn and how we teach. Next slide. So what are some tips? What are some good places to start when trying to navigate this? Um, the first thing I like to remind parents is that it's okay to feel embarrassed and not know all the answers. No one is ever prepared for the first time they are asked about where babies come from and that's okay. Being honest and genuine with yourself and your child is important. It's okay to say to your child, that was an unexpected question, let's talk about that at home or let's talk about that tomorrow. It's okay to see your child with her hand on her pants in the middle of the pasta aisle and not know what to do. I encourage parents to think about their own limits and which topics they're comfortable discussing. Maybe you have no problem helping your child learn about the parts of his body, teaching hygiene routines, but you're not comfortable talking about masturbation. And that's okay. It's good to know where your boundaries are so you can find resources to help fill those gaps. I also like to encourage parents to respond positively or at least neutrally about sex. Coming to terms with your child's sexual development is not easy or comfortable, but try to remember that everything that's happening is normal. Try to be open and non-judgmental if your child asks you a comfortable question or displays a private behavior in a public place. 
We don't want to accidentally make our children feel shameful about what they are experiencing, but we do want them to be informed and safe. We all went through puberty and experienced the same urges. Most of us were given opportunities to learn about what to do and what not to do, either in school, through socialization with peers, or through watching movies and TV shows. Um, but young people don't learn that way, and we kind of talked about it. So in missing these learning opportunities, young people make a lot of errors in engaging in private behaviors, like putting their hands in their pants in the grocery store, um, but it's not because they're doing something bad. They're just doing something private in public. Um, but with comprehensive sex education and information, we can help our young people from making these errors. I'd already kind of touched on privacy, but I just, again, it's one I really like to highlight. If you are ready to start conversations about public places and private places and the public and private behaviors, then you have to have a plan for when and how your child will access private time. Um, you can't say, Marsha, you can only do this in private and then not give Marsha an opportunity for privacy. Um, it's really important that we teach the concept of privacy for safety as well, um, because sex education may give the language to which we report abuse, but privacy awareness actually gives the concept with, in which to understand what abuse is. Um, another thing that I like to encourage parents is to not, you know, we talked about the internet being a great place, but also a scary place. Um, but there's a lot of great resources and tools on the internet. Um, one thing that I had come across was a developmental disability agency for young adults that used soap operas to talk to teach healthy relationships so the group would sit and watch 15 minutes of a soap opera and then they would kind of talk about what they saw and it was such a great tool because typically soap operas are very exaggerated in their acting so it's very obvious when something good or bad is happening um, so i thought that was a really creative way something that i certainly would have never have thought of so don't be afraid to find new creative ways to maybe teach things. Um, yeah, the internet can be a cool place sometimes. Um, try to give a consistent message. Remember trying to be neutral or positive. Um, and then use teachable moments. Teachable moments happen all the time throughout the day. Um, don't shy away from those opportunities, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable. Remember, the more we talk about it, the more normal and un less uncomfortable it will be. Next slide. So, I like to give a lot of resources to parents, but I picked these three because I think these are my three favorite and I think the three that I go to most often, um, I like them because one, two of them are free, so that's excellent. Um, but I think that there are so, there's so much that's available and there's so much out there that it can sometimes feel overwhelming and for a topic that maybe is already a little bit uh, scary to navigate, it can feel even more overwhelming when you don't even know where to start. Um, so my first recommendation is the Organization for Autism Research. If you're not familiar with them, they're a really great organization. Um, they have a wonderful website with tons of free resources for families uh, related to autism. But one thing that they put out about a year and a half ago was a, is a sex ed guide. And I love this. I have gone gone through it, I don't even know how many times. Um, it is a sexuality and sex education resource written specifically for people on the autism spectrum, age 15 and up. I, it could also be for young people who don't have autism, um, intellectual disability as well. Um, although it was created for self-advocates, so they developed it for young people to access information themselves, but I think even if your child is not able to navigate the internet and read information by themselves, it's a great resource for parents. It's a great place to learn information, to get an idea about how to have conversations, to get a sense of what are topics you should cover. Um, the information is presented in very simple language and it's a great starting place if you're trying to figure out where to begin. Um, like I said, even if your child is not able to access this website on their own, you can use the information, modify it, and present it to them in a way that they will understand. Um, so yeah, really highly recommend the sex ed guide. It was developed with all of the big experts in the sex ed field, Peter Gerhard, Catherine McLaughlin, um, and they also worked with individuals with developmental disabilities themselves in creating the guide. 
My second favorite tool is the Healthy Bodies Toolkit. Um, this is a fantastic resource. It's also free on the internet, and it was developed by Vanderbilt University's Kennedy Center. Um, there's a toolkit for boys and girls. It's printable activities. It comes with very easy instructions for parents um, and tons of pages and activities and lessons related to puberty and sexual health. Um, they have a guide for boys and a guide for girls, so I highly recommend those as well. Um, my last resource are a set of books that you can buy on Amazon. Um, they're the Tom and Ellie books, and I really like these because they were written for young people with IDD to learn about their bodies, puberty, and safety. There are a series of books, What's Happening to Tom, Tom Needs to Go, Things Tom Likes. Um, the Ellie books are the same. The What's Happening books are about puberty and body changes. The Needs to Go is about bathroom safety and bathroom etiquette. And the Things Tom or Ellie Likes is about masturbation. Um, and Marsha, I was going to ask you, do you, in turn, well, first of all, I'd love, like, Thank you so much for going through all of this in a short yes. amount of time. Like, I think it's, it, it's great information and families can get overwhelmed. So I think that like having this, this shorter period of time has been great. Yes. Um, just so, you know, people can like get a little taste. Yes. Um, but in terms of the resources, which I have, have been fortunate enough to come to your, you know, your presentations in person in the past. And, you know, I've looked at all three of these resources. I think they're like, I seconded these resources, I think are really, really great. And families should definitely, um, you know, check them out on their own and explore them. Um, in terms of the Tom and Ellie books, which I also have gone out, fortunately, and been able to purchase, which books can you share with families, which book you're thinking they should go in? Because I remember you telling me which book yeah. but I wanted you to share with family. Yeah, so I would, my my first book to start with would be the What's Happening to Tom or What's Happening to Ellie because um, I think it just gives the best overview of puberty and everything that's happening. It's a good place to start. Um, it The the books I really like because they're written in very plain language. There's no ambiguity in any of the statements. So it's very clear kind of what's happening to your body and what's happening to you. Um, it is very explicit and graphic so that can sometimes be surprising to people because you will see it's they're cartoon images um but it'll be a cartoon image of a penis or a vagina um but you know that's what your child needs to see um yeah. so i definitely encourage parents to look through it themselves before um passing it off to their child just so that they're um, feeling more comfortable with it, but that would be the one that I usually start with. Um, the next one that I like to then go to is the needs to go, especially for boys. I think it's a really good one because there's so many rules surrounding going to the bathroom for boys. Um, there are, you know, these, we call them hidden rules. Um, and so I think the needs to go is a really good one because it kind of talks about these hidden rules surrounding going to the bathroom that, you know, we learned again in our natural environment through friends and our parents, but these young people kind of need to be explicitly told what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of going through the actual book with your child, like, do you have any tips for parents on how that should be done? Um, so it's going to be, you know, based on your child and the relationship you have with your child and the comfortability you have in reading this with your child. Um, I think that if your child's able to read by themselves, they may want to read it by themselves. And so you might want to have a conversation with them. You know, hopefully you've maybe started some initial discussions about puberty or their body changes. Um, like I said, I would recommend that you read through the books yourself before giving it to your child. Um, you can have a conversation with your kid about the book and kind of telling them what it is. Um, if they're able to read on their own, maybe giving them an opportunity to read by themselves and then they can come back to you with questions. Um, if your child is not a reader, I would definitely recommend then reading to your child. Um, and I would go slowly. I would read a page and I would wait and see, you know, is there any response from your child? Um, you know, certainly if your child is nonverbal, you're going to have to be paying a lot more attention to what their face looks like, what their body looks like, if they have another form of communication, um, making sure that they're able to share their thoughts with you via that communication device, whether it's turn page or sounds good or what, whatever, whatever their, their ability is to communicate with you. Um, 
but yeah, I would definitely just go slowly. I would go one page at a time. I would kind of see what their reaction is. And I would um, regularly check in with them to see, you know, how they're feeling about it. And does this make sense? Um, and see if they have any questions. Um, this is that's not great. something that's not, this is not something that's going to happen just in one night. You know, this is going to be something that you're going to want to do throughout, throughout their adolescence and young adulthood. You know, you're not going to read what's happening to Tom one time and check it off the list that you're done. This is going to be something that you want to do repeated continuously. One, one more question. Yeah, How can, Cal, like, when do parents start to do this? Like, when should parents start to be thinking? So I know it's like crazy to, 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 to have to say it, but you should start thinking about addressing puberty before, way before your child gets to puberty. Um, I mean, you can start teaching kids about privacy and consent when they're very young. I think we should be teaching kids about their, labeling their body parts when they're small children. Um, I think every child should know how to label their parts of their body. Obviously, when we're talking about kids with disabilities, unfortunately, a lot of them are teenagers and still unable to label the parts of their body. Um, so if your child is not able to do that, that's probably the best place to start is just like, what, what do you have? What parts are you made of? Um, and the Healthy Bodies resources, they actually have some images. So yes. for families at home, there are images that you can print off or you can look at online with your, with your, um, your yeah. child and like yeah. go through and work on labeling. It's, it's really excellent. And it's like one of the, few resources I find that's like, I think it's actually really parent friendly. I think that really any parent can print it out and work on it with their child. You don't have to be a teacher or therapist necessarily. Um, so I think it's really never too early to start these conversations. But I think what ends up happening is that parents don't really address this topic until there's some sort of event, right? Your child disrobes in school. So now we need to talk about it or your child, um, inappropriately grabbed the cashier's hand at the grocery store. So now we need to talk about, you know, safe touch and not safe touch. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely not the right strategy. We don't want to wait until something happens. We want to be really proactive in our approach, especially with anything that we do, but especially with this topic, we want to be really proactive. Yeah. Thanks so much, Marsha. Thank you. This was so wonderful. So yeah, that's my email, um, stepenskym at gmail.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn. So feel free to email me or find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any questions, help point you in the direction of resources. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out. This has been really, really great. Like, again, I cannot um, express um, gratitude for you taking time out of your busy schedule um, to present this informative webinar. Um, so thank you so, so very much. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No problem at all. I'm, I'm sure this is the beginning of, of many I sexuality and DD webinars. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to learn more about PPMD and our services, please go to our website at ppmd.org, like us on Facebook, or give us a call.